Did you know? Despite being longtime rivals with Nintendo, Sega drew inspiration from multiple Nintendo games while developing Sonic Adventure. Sonic Adventure's director Takashi Izuka once told IGN.com that Super Mario 64 was one of his favorite games of all time. But despite Izuka's love for this Nintendo 64 classic, he also saw a significant flaw in the game's design. We recently translated a 2016 Japanese Famitsu interview into English where Izuka states, Super Mario 64 came before us as a 3D action game, but I remember not understanding where I was supposed to go the first time I played it. The old Sonic games were designed so you could get to the goal by just pressing left or right, so with Sonic Adventure, we didn't want it to be the kind of game where you don't know where to go. That thought process was what gave birth to the system that points the camera in the direction you're supposed to go. Mainline 2D Sonic games have always had the player hold one direction to move forward, so if a 3D camera in Sonic Adventure always leaned towards where the player should be going, players could simply hold up to cover ground. This would mimic the progression of 2D Sonic titles and intuitively bring the series' gameplay into the third dimension. Having the camera move this way also meant Sonic Team could create complex 3D levels without having to worry about the players getting lost. Bazooka would go on to tell Retro Gamer Magazine, After thinking up this camera system, we tried it out on Speed Highway and found it was successful. It's interesting that Nintendo would ultimately integrate a similar camera system in future 3D Super Mario titles after the release of Sonic Adventure. Some might even expect the first true 3D Sonic game to take cues from the first 3D Mario game, but what about that other Nintendo game that inspired Sonic Adventure's development? Just like that of an action RPG, Sonic Team wanted to include locations where the player could talk to NPCs to get information, or acquire new power-ups, or even just explore and become captivated by. They called these places adventure fields. Takashi Izuka explained to Retro Gamer that he wanted to make these adventure fields have places in them that were only accessible after acquiring some sort of new power or ability, and even went on to say, I was probably inspired in some way through the Legend of Zelda series that I loved so much. One aspect of Sonic Adventure that's beloved by most fans is its music, and it's evident that Adventure's lead composer, Jun Sunue, went to great lengths to make sure the music stood the test of time. During an interview in 2017, Sunue stated that he'd actually scrapped eight different main themes for the game before he'd finally come up with the iconic track, Open Your Heart. And it was also the sound and feel of the track that came first, with the lyrics becoming almost totally different over time. But the music and culture behind it had been impacting Sonic Adventure's identity long before Open Your Heart had even been conceived. In the mid-90s, Sonic Team shifted focus and developed a few non-Sonic titles such as Nights into Dreams and Burning Rangers. And as a result of no new mainline Sonic games being released, the team realized Sonic's popularity had dropped. They even felt that the public perception of Sonic had shifted to the point where the character felt safe and ordinary. At the same time, some members of Sonic Team had noticed that games like Space Invaders and Pac-Man were becoming popular again within the counterculture, and were being used prominently in urban fashion and indie music. Sonic Adventure's art director, Kazuyuki Hoshino, told Retro Gamer, It made us jealous, and we wanted Sonic to also become popular with this edge of subculture, or at least have some cool t-shirts being made with Sonic on them. So we all got together to try and find this new graphic style for Sonic. What it boiled down to was a graphic style and pose that was more aware of the fashion trends. The artwork was a good fit for the club music I was really into at the time. When Hoshino says, we all got together to try and find this new graphic style for Sonic, he's referring to a contest that was held within Sega. Sega's early attempts at putting Sonic in a 3D world all used designs similar to his 16-bit appearance. But this caused a problem. Sonic's head would obscure his body and limbs from various angles. It was clear to the team that Sonic's design had to be reworked for Sonic Adventure, and the solution seemed to come from the artwork of Satoshi Akano. Okano isn't well known in the industry, but he played a pivotal role in reworking Sonic's design, and sadly his contribution has gone largely ignored. The story goes that Sonic team lead Yuji Naka came across Satoshi Okano's Sonic Jam art, and was so inspired by it that Naka decided to hold a contest among Sega's artists to find a new look for Sonic. Okano took part, but it was Sega artist Yuji Uokawa who would win the contest to create the final Sonic redesigns for Adventure, which were somewhat inspired by graffiti art. However, it seems Okano may have had a bigger hand in Sonic's redesign than you might have guessed. 
In April 2020, Okano told researcher Sean Aitchison, Before New Sonic, I had drawn an illustration of Sonic, and Yuji Uakawa finished it. Because of that, the initial New Sonic illustrations were a two-person effort. This is something very few Sega employees know about. Okano would go on to create the Japanese cover art for Sonic 3D Blast on the Saturn, and serve as a character designer for Samba de Amigo. However, yet again, Yuji Uakawa would receive sole credit as character designer on Samba de Amigo. Okano says he has no ill will towards Uakawa or anyone else at Sega, and good for him. But we have to point out how it's kind of messed up that a significant contribution to both games has been ignored, and we're happy to shine a light on it. But back to Adventures development. The team took it upon themselves to make a new Sonic game that fans would feel was worth the wait. They first set out to create Sonic Adventure on the Sega Saturn, as it was Sega's main platform at the time, but the team found the system lacked the power to implement their ideas in 3D. This is when Sonic Team heard rumblings of Sega's next fully 3D console, the Dreamcast. The team even had some requests so they could make Sonic Adventure the way they truly wanted, meaning Sonic Adventure ended up actually influencing the power of the Dreamcast. Takashi Izuka recalled, To create a 3D stage where Sonic could run around at high speed, we needed a lot of internal memory on the hardware. Since the Dreamcast was still in the planning stages, we were able to spec out the design for Sonic and then we were able to put in a request to the hardware team about the required memory we would need in the machine which really helped us execute on the design of the game. We started developing the game when the hardware was only about 30% complete, so we were constantly trying to imagine what the final spec for the machine might be as we were creating the content. But this also meant the pressure was on for Sonic Team. Sonic Adventure would now be a Dreamcast launch title and needed to showcase what the system could do. To give a sense that the new console's graphics were high spec, the team decided they should aim for a realistic style with Sonic Adventure's graphics. And of course, this would carry on to the game's sequel. However, Sonic Adventure 2 had some not so realistic inspirations. Shiro Maikawa returned to write this game's story and has since stated that he was heavily influenced by anime and manga he had been watching and reading since childhood. One example of how manga and anime impacted Sonic Adventure 2 was given by Maikawa during a 2006 Sonic Channel interview. In the game, we're able to see Shadow and Maria looking at Earth from the space colony. This moment was greatly influenced by the sci-fi romance manga and anime, Please Save My Earth. Please Save My Earth focuses on a group of students who realize they all share a collective dream and live out alternate lives within a moon base while dreaming. In both the manga and anime, the characters Shien and Mokarin are seen embracing each other beside a window, with the Earth in full view. It's not surprising Maikawa would reference this scene, considering he puts Please Save My Earth in his top three manga of all time. And by some huge coincidence, the actress Yuri Shiratori, who voices Alice in the anime, that's Mokarin's schoolgirl Earthling counterpart and lead of the show, ended up being cast as Maria in the Japanese version of Sonic Adventure 2. Maikawa said it seemed like destiny, but it also seems like he was pushing for Sonic to go into space from the get-go. Early on in the game's production, Maikawa proclaimed in front of all his colleagues, Sonic will go to space this time, because it's become the 21st century already! At first, everyone was shocked at this choice in story direction, but everyone eventually got on board, leading to the space colony section of the game being made. Interestingly, Maikawa is not a fan of Sonic's character in the 16-bit games, and felt that it didn't fit Sonic at all. So when he got the chance to write the story for Sonic Adventure, he set out to create a version of Sonic that he himself would like. But for Sonic Adventure 2, Maikawa ended up writing his favorite character of the entire franchise, Shadow the Hedgehog. Early on in the game's development, it had already been decided that there would be a Black Hedgehog character. But other than being cool like Sonic, his personality had not been yet settled on. That was until late one night on the drive home from work, when Shadow crept into Maikawa's mind. Maikawa was mentally going over the scene where Sonic confronts Shadow for the first time, and Sonic blurts out, I found you, faker. Shadow spoke out in Maikawa's mind for the first time, saying, Faker? I think you're the fake hedgehog around here. Maikawa grew fond of Shadow, and even told Sonic Channel, there are times when I feel a stronger bond with Shadow than my true relatives. I cannot think of others anymore. One of the most fondly remembered aspects of the Sonic Adventure games are the Chow. And there's quite a few interesting facts relating to these little critters too. There's an unused line in Sonic Adventure 2's data where Amo Chow states, Did you know the doctor's mustache is fake? This voice clip had been used to infer that Dr. Eggman's mustache is fake by some extremely poor fact checkers. <coughs> but this is actually not the case. The Japanese version has a nearly identical piece of unused audio which makes it clear that Omo Chow is not referring to Eggman but to a Dr. Chow. Another name for the Chow principal, who has a suspiciously fake looking mustache. And another unused line has Omo Chow say, Don't play a TV game over one hour. 
which frankly is advice you can ignore. But what you shouldn't ignore is this curious piece of data that went undiscovered for over two decades. In the root directory of all US copies of the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure, there's some old file upload data in the form of two bin files, Sonic ADV underscore H00.bin and Sonic ADV underscore H04.bin. These files use an earlier structure compared to the final file format, and while they aren't compatible with any version of the final game as is, there is some interesting data within these files. Within one of these files is actually a baby Chow called Buddy. The Chow is about 65% of the way towards evolving and wears a set of rabbit ears. This little guy was submitted by Sega A at Concentric.net, which is presumably a Sega employee. Sonic Adventure 2 has 20 unique types of Chow, but only 10 can be obtained normally, including DLC Chow. A lot of these unobtainable Chow are only seen in the Chow races, but can be put into the gardens with cheats. That said, there are two kinds of Chow that go completely unused. These are actually part of a trio along with the Moon Chow, a Dreamcast DLC Chow. While most unused Chow from the original game were removed from Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, even more unused Chow can be found along with all the unique types of eggs that go along with them. There's also another set of eggs linked to Chow, but due to the way these Chow are acquired, the eggs go unused. Just like most eggs in the game, these eggs also have shiny variants. Exclusively within Sonic Adventure 2's original release, a picture can be seen on the walls of the Chow Kindergarten showing a playground. There's even textures within the game that match the picture from the kindergarten. And when these textures are applied to geometry discovered within the PC version, we can get an idea of what this area would have looked like, and the impression that it was once a playable area. It seems there was also a library planned at some point, and based on its file name, it seems like it was also planned to be accessible from the kindergarten. In the library, players could download or create new stories for Chow Adventure 2. While this was never fully implemented, Chow Adventure 2 still had the modular design needed to support multiple stories, and there's 10 unused story files on the disc. Fans have heavily requested for Chow and Chow Gardens to return to the Sonic series. But why exactly did they disappear in the first place? According to a 2004 Takashi Izuka interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, it's because a Chow Garden would apparently have broken up the action of Sonic games post-adventure. Izuka told EGM, In Sonic Adventure, we created the Chow Garden so that new players would be forced to go out, explore the action sections, and find flickies and things. In Sonic Heroes, even if you're completely new to Sonic, you can play as Team Rose and learn how the game works. The level up items are the new motivating factor in Heroes. Izuka would go on to say that flickies were removed from Heroes so that folks who played Sonic Adventure wouldn't be confused and think there was a Chow Garden hidden somewhere, and also that the Sonic Adventure subseries hadn't ended. Based on this, we might assume that Chow Gardens might return someday, but they never did. If you have a longing for Chow Garden and wish it was its own game, I know of a particular game that's on Kickstarter right now that is that exactly. Being made by me. The game is called Poglings, which is about cute little creatures that hatch from eggs and are raised to race each other. If you could check out our Kickstarter and show your support for it, it would mean a lot. We have rewards like early game beta access for backers and much more. There's a link to it in the description below the video. If you want more Sonic facts, check out the video on screen for a whole hour of Sonic trivia. Special thanks to Jacob Newcomb for the Famitsu translation and Blaze Hedgehog for proofreading. Don't forget to subscribe and give this video a like. And thanks for watching. See you next time.